Well, hello, everybody. If, if anybody doesn't know me, um, uh, I'm Pastor Jason Robinson. I pastor Mountain Baptist Church in West Virginia. So actually, this area right here feels like home. Um, so just put me out in the woods, and I'm good to go. Um, so I, I, I prepared a sermon before I got on the plane. Um, and the name of the sermon is Making a Difference. And I guess it's a little fitting or felicitous that I made a bunch of differences on my sermon when I was on, on the plane ride. So I was basically, uh, you know, just kind of thinking about the sermon and all that stuff. So if, my, if I'm all over the place, that's probably because of that. So my notes are all out of order. Um, but sometimes those are the fun sermons anyway. So uh, it, you're there in Jude in verse 22. And uh, I do want to thank Pastor uh, uh, Burzins and, and the family and just everybody out here. It's been great fellowship. Um, I've only, you know, I've been out here since yesterday, and so kind of wish I could have been here a little longer. Um, and maybe next year the whole family can come out here and all that. So um, just had a great time uh, winning horseshoes, you know. No, I'm just kidding, just playing, playing horseshoes. <clears throat> but if, I, if I'm, like, coughing or something like that, it, you got to blame Pastor Anderson and Pastor Burzins for forcing me to swim across the river or the lake <clears throat> because I'm either out of shape, can't swim, or both. So, um, but uh, no, it's been a good time. But uh, you're there in Jude in verse 22. It says, and if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spied by the flesh. And the verse I want you to really hone in on there is in verse 22, where it says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. And if there's anything that I want to do in life is to make a difference, okay? When it comes to, you know, getting saved, obviously getting saved is easy. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you could literally just get saved and say, I'm just going to live a comfortable life and just eat and just be comfortable till you die, you know? And, and, but you're not going to make a difference that way, okay? And <clears throat> go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And you know what? In the world today... There's a lot of people out there that want to make a difference. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, conservative pundits out there and politicians, and they may have this, this idea as far as, okay, we need to save our country. We need to make a difference. But listen, Fox News isn't going to make the difference in our country, okay? Ben Shapiro is not going to make a difference in our country, okay? And, you know, definitely not Sean Hannity, uh, Glenn Beck, who's the, who's the people out there, you know, Steven Crowder, I might be stepping on toes, okay? But these people aren't going to be the ones that are going to make a difference in our country, okay? Or in the world, for that matter. And look what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 1. There says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in, in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit, profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. And here, here's the thing. We're all going to die one day, Lord willing, unless the, unless the Lord comes back in our day, right? And... We have a short space of time to do something for the Lord. But if you just live for the things of this world and just for the pleasures of this world, it's all vanity. Right now, I'm not saying that you know, we can't have a good time and come out here and have good fellowship. But listen, you know, that, that's not going to be the thing that's going to make a difference. See, this, this conference, if you will, or where we're having this preaching time, this isn't going to make a difference unless you take what you learn and take what you've heard and apply it. You've got to take this and use it. Okay? And we've already heard some great preaching. Last night was some really good preaching. Okay? About having a, a, you know, a, a zealous, uh, you know, basically walk with the Lord and how you keep up that zeal by having a good routine. But then also just the idea that who are we seeking for out soul winning, having compassion, caring for others. And you need to take those lessons, and sorry, I don't have the other sermons. I haven't re heard them, but all right, I'm sure they were great, too, <laughs> earlier this week. Um, but that being said, you need to take that and, you know, apply that after this meeting, okay? Now, uh, in Ecclesiastes here, it's basically saying one generation passes away and another cometh. It's basically saying, listen, <clears throat> there's going to be another generation that comes. You know, I, I always thought I was young. And then I'm starting to get old. My joints start hurting. You know, can't swim across the lake very well. You know, like, and you know what? 
but there's another generation that's coming up and you know younger people that are coming up and a lot of people say well your generation your gener the millennial generation somehow I somehow get in there I was born in 85 depending on who you talk to I'm in the millennial generation and you say the millennials are lost well I see a lot of millennials that that are doing great things for God but you know what so what if that generation's lost there's another generation coming and you could be that generation young people you could be that generation that says, you know what, we're actually going to live for God. Yeah. We're actually going to turn this, this world upside down. Yeah. And you know what, there's no profit eternally for the things that we do under the sun. Okay? Now go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Now the first thing that I, I have basically three points I want to hit on as far as making a difference. How are you going to make a difference? This isn't all inclusive, but just things that, that I think about. Now the first thing should be what's in that verse, which it says, and of some have what? compassion making a difference and if some have compassion making a difference notice what it says here in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly really is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So the first thing that you have to think about, you say, well, why do you go out soul winning? Well, it should be because you care about people. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if you go out soul winning and you win someone to Christ, listen, there was some compassion there. Okay? There's some love there. But if you want to be a really good soul winner, and you want to see a lot of fruit, and you want to see great things done with soul winning, you need to get some compassion. Amen. Okay? You have to have enough compassion to, to go out there instead of just going home and just sleeping or whatever you're, you know, whatever you're going to do uh, other than go soul winning. You have to have enough compassion to go there, but when you're at the door, you need to have compassion on that person. And, you know, Jesus looked upon the multitudes and he had compassion. And a lot of the multitudes may not even like us, okay? But we need to have compassion like Jesus had compassion. You know, Jesus, when he was being nailed to the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we need to have this compassion. When you're at the door and talking to somebody, you need to not look at that as it's just another number. And listen, we're not one of those people like, that, that are against getting a lot of people saved. We want to get a lot of people saved. You say, well, would you rather, you know... Uh, you know, that one person that you spend your whole life getting saved and that's the only person you get saved or 20 people okay obviously I want 20 people to get saved okay I want more people to get saved not less but when you go out soul winning it's not just another number out there when you go out soul winning and you talk to that person they know whether you care you can't fake compassion okay they know whether you're just there, just doing your duty, just, just trying to get another one under your belt, and all that. Okay, listen, if you go soul winning out of duty, go out of duty. Okay, I'm not here to say like you need to feel awesome about going soul winning every time you go. Okay, but listen, when you go up to that door, there should be a time where you say, listen, it's time for me to care. Okay, and when you talk to that person, you need to talk to them as if it's your family member. Okay, imagine that. You have a family member that needs to get saved, okay? And then you know that there's going to be a soul winner that's going to come to the door. How do you want them to treat that family member? Okay? How much care do you want them to have? Because obviously you would say, I want them to have all the care in the world, be as patient and kind as possible, be gentle and meek, and try to get them saved as much as possible, okay? We need to have compassion. We need to, to care about those people. And you say, I don't know this person from Adam. I know, but you still need to care. And people know whether you care or not. And you can make, don't make it fake, okay? Don't be, a, don't be one of those over-spiritual fake Christians, okay? If there's anything I can't stand, it's fake Christianity when it comes to this over-the-top spirituality. And you know that, you know, you know, God bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was nice to meet you today. I beseech you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you listen to me today. And listen... That's great, and that, you know, that's how we write literature, that's how we talk. But you don't talk to people like that, okay? You talk to them normal, okay? And obviously you read the scriptures and you read that off, but you need to care, and they can see that immediately, okay? You can't fake that. 
And Jesus had compassion. Go to, uh, go to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Psalm 126. And I've seen, listen, I, I've been out soul winning with people that are not loving, okay? And I'm not saying these people are unsaved. I'm not, say, I'm not here to, to say, you know, that they're like a, a Judas or anything like that. But I have gone out with people that, were Judas, that turned out to be Judases as well, okay? <laughs> but, but at the same time, like, I've gone out with people, and they knock on the door. A person would knock the door and we say, you know, uh, just inviting you out to church. Do you, have a, do you go to church anywhere around here? And the person would say, no, I don't go to church. And the person would say, well, don't you think you should? <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to crawl. I was on like a third floor balcony, and I wanted to just jump off the balcony. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm not with him. <laughs> you know? I'm like, first of all, that's not why we're out. I mean, obviously, we want them to come to church, okay? But that's not the main prerogative that we're trying to do there, okay? And I'm just like, so that person ended up being a Judas. Now, there are other cases, though, where there's people that are just mean. You know, when you talk to somebody, you're not scowling at them. Like, you, you go up to them and be like, do you know 100% sure you're going to heaven? You know, and you're just, you're just mean. No, you should be nice, not fake, okay? But you need to turn it on, okay? When, when you get up and preach, okay? When I get up and preach, there's a time to turn it on. Okay, I'm not just going around when I when I was back there talking or you know just talking with you guys. I'm not like, hey guys, you know you you want to go play horseshoes, you know, and you're just like just ripping face about it, you know, like ready to go swim. <laughs> you look like a crazy person, but no, but you got it. You got to obviously know when to turn it on. Okay, not fake. You know, I'm not being fake. You know, I'm just obviously there's a time to preach and there's a time to just be you know just a normal conversation. But when it comes to compassion, you need to know when to turn that on, when to care, okay? Now, in Psalm 126, in verse 5 here, notice what it says. It says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, there's so much packed into this passage. And Pastor Jimenez was hitting on the fact that you're bringing your sheaves with you. You know, he's kind of hitting on that point. But the point I want to point out there is in tears, yeah. weeping. Okay? You don't fake that. Amen. Okay? Unless you're like some Hollywood actor, you know. <laughs> but you don't fake that. That's real. Now, I'm not saying that you, every person you talk to, you just got to be weeping. Okay? But what this is implying, and some people, maybe you are weeping. Maybe there's loved ones that you care about that want to, you want them to get saved, and they're in some false religion, or they just don't want to accept eternal security, and you just want them to get saved. Listen, compassion's how you're going to win them. Caring for them's how you're going to win them. You know how I won my mom to the Lord who, was, who grew up Catholic? It wasn't about winning an argument. Okay? And if you think I'm hard-headed, meet my mom. Okay? It runs in the family. And the thing is, is that it's not going to be this argument. You're not there to win this argument. Okay, we're right. Of course we're going to win the argument. But the thing is, is that that's not why we're there. We're there to win them. Okay? And the thing is, is that with my mom, the thing that won her was she knew I cared. Okay? Because I literally was weeping, over, not in front of her, but for her to get saved. Okay? Praying weeping, praying. You know why? Because I believe there's a hell. Yeah, good. You know why? Because I love my mom Amen. and I wanted my mom to get saved. Right, and you know what? There was a point where, you know, my mom and I, we would get into fights. She would like cry and my dad would be like, you need to back off a little bit and, you know, like just give her some space. But, you know, I cared. I wanted her to get saved. But there was just a time where this wall broke down and she saw that I cared. It wasn't about me winning an argument. It wasn't about me saying, hey, I was right, you're wrong. It's about the fact that I actually love her and I don't want to see her go to hell, that I want her to be saved. And you know what? All those walls broke down. She got saved. She's now coming to my church. Amen. And they come every single week. And I baptize my mom. Amen. So, but that takes compassion, okay? Amen. And listen, all of you have probably even had those experiences or just, or maybe you want that experience. Maybe you have loved ones. Listen, compassion is how you're going to do it. Okay? Obviously, you've got to speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. 
Okay. Now, you know, weeping, tears, you need to have compassion. And Jesus had compassion on the multitudes. Uh, in Matthew chapter 14, <clears throat> you can turn there if you'd like. Matthew 14 and verse 13, Jesus had compassion. It wasn't just this one time. Now, obviously, in chapter 9, we're dealing with soul winning. He's looking on the multitudes and he's saying the, har the, the, the harvest is ripe. And he's, he's saying we need, more, we need more laborers into the harvest. Pray for more laborers. Why? Because there's so many people that need to hear it and that want to hear it. And they're, listen, I love that sermon that Pastor Jimenez was preaching because it's so true. You, you say, what keeps you going soul winning? One, compassion. Okay? We, 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 love, we, we love people. We want them to get saved. We don't want to see people go to hell. Okay? Compassion is a big reason. But another reason is experience. Experience knowing that there is that person that is just waiting to hear it. And if you don't go soul winning very much, you may not know this. Okay? But you're going to run into somebody who says, listen, I was just thinking about this. I was just thinking about this. I was just talking to my roommate about this. I was just thinking about, you know, my, my family member just died. We were just talking about this. And they are literally like, what must I do to be saved? There was one time we did a soul winning marathon, and there was literally a guy. We were on the street, and there was literally a guy that literally stopped in the middle of the street, got out of his truck, and said, what do I need to do to be saved? No lie. <laughs> I mean, you can't make that up. I mean, but there, now that's never happened again after that. But now obviously, I don't know who this guy, if he, who he knew we were or anything like that, but he was obviously seeking for something. I mean... Thank the Lord it wasn't Jehovah's Witnesses walking down the street when he jumped out of his truck. But, you know what, there are people that are seeking, but we need to have compassion. And, and Matthew chapter 14 and verse 13, it says, When Jesus heard of it, <clears throat> he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had <clears throat> heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. It says in Acts chapter 10, you don't have to turn there, but in verse 38 it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. See, Jesus just went, he went around doing good. He went around having compassion on others. Okay? And we need to have that. Okay? And <clears throat> we don't want to leave that aside. And obviously, I want you to be zealous for soul winning. But listen, when you go out soul winning, you need to care. You need to care. You need to care about the people that you're talking to. You need to have compassion on them. And that's how you're going to make a difference. And if some have compassion, making a difference. And listen, you know, the, the Bible says that what is our life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes the way. It says go to now because, listen, we don't have that much time. And, you know, young people, you know, the children, teenagers, you may, you may think you have a lot of time. Listen, it was just yesterday I was 18 years old. Just yesterday, you know, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to say it, but I am going to say it. You know what? You, time flies. Okay. And the thing is, is that, you know, older people, you know, my grandparents would say that to me. My parents say that to me. And then you get, then you're 36 and you're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and you're like, that's young, you know. But the thing is, is that time does go by quick. And before you know it, we were just talking about, uh, we, you know, back in 2009, 2008, and it was just, it seemed like yesterday. And some of you weren't alive yet. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people in here that weren't alive yet, you know, when that, when that took place. Um, but here's the thing. The Bible says in first, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's great to have a lot of knowledge. It's great to know a lot of doctrine. But listen, d don't forget this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Listen, it's easy for us to get prideful, and especially when we're out soul winning, to say, listen, I need to show this guy what's up. He doesn't know who he's dealing with. You know, and and you know what? I have church members, and my church members, you know, are are loyal to me, love me, and you know, when when we're out soul winning, and I'm out soul winning with them, and someone like challenges me, they're just like stepping back and be like, I can't wait to see this, you know, 
because they think I'm just going to like throw down on everybody that I run into and just be like, this is what's up, this is what's up, this is what's up, you don't know what you're talking about, and just throw down on them. But here's the thing, when I'm out soul winning, I'm not out there just to flex my intellectual muscles, yeah, okay? Yeah. They're not that big anyway, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but, but I'm not just out there to do that. You know, it, it's interesting, even the word choices here, knowledge puffeth up, you know, the idea of pride and just kind of puffing yourself up. And listen, I work out and I like to work out and all that, but, and you should work out on your knowledge too. But you're not out there just to flex your knowledge. Okay? Listen, the gospel's simple. Amen. Keep it simple. Okay? Amen. Keep it simple. The simplicity that's in Christ, if it's getting complicated, you're veering off from the gospel. Okay? You don't need to talk about the lost tribe of Dan. <laughs> and listen, people bring up weird stuff all the time. You're like, what are you talking about? And Revelation chapter 7 doesn't mention the tribe of Dan, and people get caught up on that stuff. And I'm just like, whoa, man, you need to get your priorities straight. And so that's the thing is that you need to keep it simple and know this charity edified. When, when you, for example, even in social media, okay, when you post something, why are you posting it? Okay, why are you posting it? Is it to edify and to get the, the truth out or is it just to piss people off? Okay, now the truth will definitely piss people off. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but if you're out there just for that reason, and that's the only reason you're posting it, is just to make people angry and do that. I don't believe that's a good reason. I think that, and even if you're right, okay, it should be because you want people to know the truth. And listen, I'm not against people getting angry. Okay? You know, a lot of times I know exactly what I'm posting. This is going to make people angry. I'm not against calling people out. Calling out false prophets, calling out people that believe wrong, that, that are teaching false, false gospels. Put them through the floor. Okay? I don't care what you say to them. You know, it's like the, it's like the fags. You know, you, you thought I was going there, right? I was in Jude. This isn't a sermon about that. But listen, there's nothing that you could ever offend me about what you say about the fags. Okay? When you're dealing with reprobates and child molesters, listen, there's nothing. nothing you, I don't care what you post. I'd be like, good. <laughs> I, may, I not, may not be able to like it publicly. <laughs> because... Because I don't want to, like, think that people, I approve of that language, okay? But, but inside, I'm, inside, I'm like, I agree with that. <laughs> now, that being said, okay, I'm not, I'm not against offending people, and I'm not uh, against getting people upset. But listen, there sh you should be, listen, I'm not putting stuff on there for reprobates. Does that make sense? I'm putting it on there so that people know about it, that, that can actually understand. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why we don't mess with heretics. That's why we don't mess with them. Because why would we waste our time with that? The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in verse 14, or in, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse thir uh, 13 there, it says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, let all your things be done with charity. So we need to have compassion. Go to, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And listen, you know, even when I'm ripping face, okay, when I'm preaching a sermon and I'm just ripping face, calling out people, listen, that's in love. Because faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, the thing is, is that you can rip face, be angry, and you can, you can hit the truth and still have charity, okay? But I'm not preaching to the reprobates. Does that make sense? I'm not preaching to them. I'm preaching to you. Because I care about you. I want you to know the truth. I want you to know what they are and who they are. Now, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, when you're outside of dealing with people that, are, that can't understand, when you're at the door, when you're giving the gospel, notice what it says in verse 24. So, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 24, says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And why does it say, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth? Because in the next chapter it says, there's some that are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There, the Bible says now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth. 
men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. There are people out there that, that can't repent. They can't be renewed again unto repentance. And, but it's saying, less peradventure. You know, meaning that when you're at the door, unless, unless it's someone that is just like obviously a God hater and you know you're going to be wasting your time, listen, you just need to give them benefit of the doubt. If they'll listen, give them the gospel. Okay? And you need to be meek, gentle with them. See, a lot of people think that when we get up here and preach and we're just ripping face, you know, ripping face, taking names, that that's how we deal with people out when we go soul winning. And then when people could come visit my church or visit other, other pastors' churches and they go out soulning with them, they're like, this is completely different. Or they even talk to us and they're like, you don't sound anything like you do when you're preaching. Yeah, because there's a difference between preaching, you know, in front of saved people and behind a pulpit than it is preaching the gospel to somebody in meekness and gentleness. And when we go out soul winning, listen, I, I try to be gentle. And there's some people you got to be really gentle with. Right? There's some people that you could use discernment and you, you think, okay, I, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> there's some people that, that you could just basically be coming back and forth with them and you're just kind of having a good time talking about this, right? And then there's other people, there's like women that you'll talk to and you almost have to like whisper to them because you're afraid if you talk too loud, you'll scare them. Right. And you're just like, listen, I, I don't want to... You know, some people are just like, you're going to hell, buddy, if you don't believe. And he's like, you're probably right, you know? And, and you're just like, you're very blunt with them. And other people, you're like, listen, I know this isn't, this isn't you know, good news. Okay? But the Bible says that if we don't believe on Christ, you know, all liars shall have the part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, we're all in the same spot. And you know, we're all there. You know, but you know, we would all you know, go to hell. And, and you would just be very gentle with it. And other people are like, listen, buddy, all liars go to hell. And you can just be very blunt with them. And they're blunt with you. And, and just how you deal with people, but it takes discernment. But in either case, in all those cases, you're being gentle, and I'm not just ripping someone's face off. Okay? Now, go to... Uh, now, here's where my notes go rogue. Okay, so... <laughs> so, I have three points. The first point is to have compassion. It's in the verse. Okay? And if some have compassion, making a difference. Okay? My second point is that to make a difference, you have to put a difference. To make a difference, you have to put a difference. Go to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 10 and look at verse 8 there. So to make a difference, you need to have compassion. To make a difference, you need to put a difference. So what do I mean by that? Well, in verse 8 here, it says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between, the hol between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Listen, if there's any generation that needs to put a difference between something that, that right now is right in this world is today, okay? There needs to be a difference between the clean and the unclean, okay? Between the holy and the unholy. So we need to put a difference. And, and today, you know, everybody's calling evil good and good evil. They're calling bitterness sweet and sweet bitter. They're calling light darkness and darkness light. There needs to be a difference. Amen. And listen, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be effective, if you're gonna make a difference, you have to put a difference between those things. Okay? And <clears throat> you know, between the clean and the unclean, and and you know, think of this, uh, between a godly family and wicked sodomy. And listen, today, today everybody is downplaying the Christian family and the fact of having the father, the mother, and having kids as being something that's bad. It's the patriarchy. We need to destroy the patriarchy. And men are bad, especially straight white men. So, listen, I mean, you're pretty much looking at a Nazi right now, apparently, to them, because, because I am, all that is bad, all that is bad is right here, okay? And the thing is, is that we need to put a difference between that. And, and you know what? Listen, Fox News isn't going to do this. Okay? 
I love what Pastor Shelley said because he was saying that you're not going to hear this anywhere else. You're not going to hear this on Fox News. You're not going to hear this on any of your conservative pundits. Okay? Because when they talk about this, they're saying, listen, we're against gay marriage and we just want to have marriage between a man and a woman. Show me chapter and verse on that. Show me chapter and verse on the fact that men and men can't be married. I'll show you a chapter and verse where it says, if a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. But that's not going to come out of their lips, will it? They're not going to say that because that doesn't fit their narrative. That doesn't fit you know, what they, what they want to hear because they are trying to be easy on and be like, well, we don't agree with that. That's a sin. It's an abomination. Amen. It's an abomination, and the Bible says in the New Testament that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. That they're reprobate. The Bible says that they, that they received in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And listen, there needs to be a difference between the holy and the unholy, between the clean and the unclean. And listen, listen, young people, listen, uh, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. But listen, marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled. Okay? But listen, that's completely backwards in our world today. Completely backwards. There needs to be a difference between that, and we need to know what's right and what's wrong. And listen, you know where you're going to hear that? You're not going to hear that <clears throat> out in the world. The world has changed a lot since, I've been, since I was a kid. When I was a kid, you know, queers, sodomy, that was looked down on hard. People made, movies made fun of it. Like, you know, th th that was not the good guy. Okay? That was the person you're like, you don't want to be that guy. And... Nowadays, it's glorified. And listen, you give them a finger, they'll take a hand. Right. Know this, and don't forget this, they're implacable. They're implacable. You know what that means? They can't be placated, they can't be pacified. And they, you know what? People are starting to figure this out. And they get into the fact that, well, gay marriage, we'll give them gay marriage. And then, there's, then, then they, they, they come for more. They're like, well, it's not only gay marriage, but we need to not only say that it's not wrong, but it's righteous. And you know, this is something that has been preached for years, but people haven't been listening. They think that, they think that we're crazy. They thought Pastor Anderson was crazy when he said that these people are pedophiles. But now what are they going after? Love is love, and love doesn't have an age. They've always been going after the children. And this might be the line where a lot of people say, you know what, I'm done with it. But you know what, we need people to thunder from the mountaintops that it's wicked, it's vile, and there needs to be a difference between the holy and the unholy. Amen. And you know what? I'm sick of seeing it. Yeah. I'm sick of it just being shoved down our throats. Yeah. And listen, all you need is just a small group of people to stand up. Right. And a lot of people, listen, most people feel the way we do about it. Most people know it's vile. Most people don't like it. Most people think it's disgusting. But most people are afraid. That's right. They're afraid of the consequences. Amen. They're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid that people aren't going to like it. They're afraid to lose their friends. And listen, Young people, I know I, I was a teenager one time, and listen, what people think of you is everything, okay? And it's a hard time to toe that line. This is why homeschooling is so important, okay? Because in, in, in school, listen, public school is not what it was when I was a kid. And, I wasn't, and listen, I wouldn't have been for it back then, you know, what I know now. But i dead sure I'm not for it now. Now, I mean, good night. If you want your kids' minds to be poisoned, that's where it's going to be poisoned. Okay? And they are just shoveling this down. And listen, it, it is a harder time to be, uh, you know, of those, those young ages right now. Harder time than ever. Even if you're not in public school, just dealing with all that and people pushing this down your throat and saying, you're just a bigot, you're a racist, you're all of this, all the isms and ists that are out there, they're going to try to put that on you. But listen, if you want to make a difference, now if you want to live your life and you just want to live comfortably and just be saved and die and go to heaven and not worry about anything, then don't do anything. Just go along and get along. But if you want to make a difference in this world, 
If you, want, if you don't want this world to go to hell in a handbasket, if you want to actually see something done you know, against what all this stuff that's being pushed out, then you've got to put a difference between the holy and the unholy. Amen. But you know, what? you know what's interesting is how the world gets everything backwards because they don't want to put a difference between that. They want to put a difference between race. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 12. What is the big fights today? What are the big fights today? Well, racism's like a big fight today. It's the wrong fight. Yeah. Now, I hate, I hate racism. It's stupid. The whole, the whole idea of it is just dumb. Okay? The Bible says in Acts chapter 17 that he has made of one blood all nations. Okay? And in Romans chapter 10, and bear with me because I forgot that I'm on my back sheet here and I don't have it printed out. Um, Romans chapter 10, what I want you to see here is that verse, uh, go to verse, uh, I have you on verse 12 there. Verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all. Uh, rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all the same in his sight. Right. There is no difference. Right. And you know what? Baptist churches want to put a difference between the Jew and the Greek, don't they? Yep. This Zionism garbage that's coming out, or that's been out, and they want to keep putting a difference where the Bible says there's no difference. Right. Yeah. Right. But listen, there is no difference. I don't care what your skin color is. I, I, don't, I don't care. I, literally, it's impossible for me to care less on what your skin color is. Okay? And the thing is, is that they're trying to pit us against each other. And you go out and people are just on high alert. You know, if you're white, you're on high alert because you feel like, you feel like everybody's like thinking that you're racist and that, you know, you're coming after them, you're trying to kill them or something like that. And then everybody else is just on high alert because they're told that we're all trying to kill you and then we're trying to go after you and all this stuff. It's like, <laughs> but here's the thing. Listen, get off news and you'll find out that that's not the case, okay? We're, we're not, most people are just normal people that don't feel like that at all. Are there outliers? Of course there are. There's morons out there that, that are racists. You know, there's, there's people out there that actually are white supremacists and all that. But listen, the Bible says there's no difference. So you need to know where to put the difference. Okay? Where's the difference between holy and unholy? Between light and darkness? Between sweet and bitter? Not between skin color. Or what country you come from. Or what food you like to eat. <laughs> okay? You know, and, and just, just stupid things that don't matter. And we get into the wrong fights. We get distracted. When we, be, we need to be talking about the real issues. You know what the real issues are? God's commandments. You know what the real issues are? The sins that are in our country today. Yeah. You know what people should be angry about? Is that 3,000 babies are being murdered every single day yeah. through abortion. That's what people should be yelling about. Right. And no one talks about it. And no one's really screaming from the mountaintops except for the fundamental Baptists. Okay? And you know what? We need to toe the line to make that difference. And we need to preach it hard. Now, go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Are you saying, Pastor Robinson, that we need to go pick it a, a, you know, a planned parenthood? No. That's not what I'm saying. <clears throat> you know what you need to do? You need to teach people the truth. You know what? When we go out soul winning... It's interesting how much people have questions about things that don't deal with the gospel. I just won a lady to the Lord last week, and <clears throat> we were talking and all that stuff. She grew up Catholic, and uh, she, was, she was asking me, she's like, she's like, the big hang-up I have is that I just can't imagine going to heaven and have someone in heaven with me that hurt children. I'm like, yeah, I agree with you, because they're not going to be there. You know, pedophiles, they're not going to be there. Because those people are past feeling. They've been rejected by God. And they're going to go to hell. And this lady, you know what she told me? I said, you know there's people, I said, they cannot believe. And she literally said to me, she's like, show me that. 
Okay? Now, at this point, I was just trying to get into the gospel with her. Okay? And she said she didn't really have time, all that. She said, show me that. So I took her to John chapter 12, where it says that they could not believe for Isaiah said who, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not be converted, right? And I showed her that, and it was just like this. She's like, whoa, said that. Then I took her to 2 Timothy chapter 2, where it says they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth, reprobate concerning the faith. And she says, she's like, wow. She's like, you know, I was actually abused as a child. And she told me this, that she was abused as a child, and obviously she's like, you know, I just couldn't reconcile that. You know, she grew up Catholic, and, you know, everybody tells her, you know, well, you just need to forgive them and all this stuff that's going on. She ended up getting saved. Amen. You know, I used to be able to count on my fingers how many people I've gotten saved that started off talking about the reprobate doctrine, but I can't anymore. You know why? It's not, it's not because I bring it up. They bring it up. You know why they bring it up? Because everybody's shoving it down their throat right now. Everybody just sees this constantly, and they're just, the first thing to come out about, what do you think about homosexuals? What do you think about pedophiles? I don't want to, I literally had a person in Sacramento when I was out soul winning for Verity Baptist Church. This lady was going to work. She's like, I gotta go to work. She's like, but I don't want to hear it because I can't imagine that some rapist pedophile is going to heaven. And I said, well, they're not. And I, and I showed her the reprobate down. She's like, okay, you can show me now. And she got saved. And you know what? People are always saying, you know what? You're going to turn people off of that reprobate doctrine. But again, I can't count with my fingers anymore how many people I've got saved because I explained the reprobate doctrine to them and they understood that these vile freaks are not going to get saved. Okay? And so we need to make a difference. And listen, people are waiting. They want that. I think I remember you did an interview, Pastor Anderson did an interview where he was talking to someone in, in, in Ireland. He was talking to some radio host, and this guy gets on the phone, and I don't think this guy was claiming to be Christian or anything like that. He was like, listen, we need him. <laughs> we need to hear what he has to say, because things are getting so weird, so crazy, we're doing something wrong. And I think a lot of people are coming to that conclusion, and listen, it's a time to put a difference between those. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. <clears throat> we need to put a difference to make a difference. You want to make a difference in this world? You need to rightly divide the word of truth. Yeah, that's good. You need to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you need to have the word of God that's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and that will divide asunder even soul and spirit. And here's the thing. If you want, if you want to make a difference, you've got to have the Word of God. Listen, this is where the difference is going to be made. But you know what the Bible does? It divides. Jesus said, I came not to send peace, but division. Division. Everybody thinks that Jesus wants to sing Kumbaya with everybody. But he says, I am come to put variance between the mother and the daughter. And the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law and all that. So... You know what? We need to put a difference there. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. I haven't memorized, but I'm going to end up butchering it if I try to. So, I think this was the memory verse last night, right? Someone had this one. Verse 5 there, it says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, this isn't a sermon to talk about dress standards, but listen, you know what this verse, obviously, I believe that women should wear dresses, men should wear pants, breeches, and, you know, that's a sermon for another day. But you know what the big point here is? There's a difference. There's a difference between men and women. And today, those, those lines are being blurred. They're being blurred. And if there's a time, ladies, to just dress feminine and men to dress masculine, it's now. Men, it's time to get the car hard out. You know, get those Carhartt jeans out and get, the, get all, I, I'm joking. You know, obviously you don't have to just wear bib overalls and I'm from West Virginia, you know, so, but, you know, the idea is that it's time to dress feminine ladies, it's time to dress masculine men, don't toe that line, okay, everybody's like, I'm trying to get close to that line, is this still a man's garment or is this still a woman's garment? And you're trying to toe this line, you know what, you should be over here where it's like, no doubt, this is feminine. No doubt, 
This is masculine. Okay? Because nowadays, I feel sorry for the young people that are looking you know, for a significant other, you know, that are looking for a, a wife or a husband, because it's hard to tell these days. Okay? The men's pants are so tight, you know, and they have long hair a lot of times, too. And, and, and the women, I mean, I, I don't know what's going on a lot of times with them. But you know what? You look from behind, you're like, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know if it's a man or if it's a woman, you know, and, and you know what, I'll say this, what's good from far is far from good a lot of times that I find out, and you know what, we need a difference though. Yeah. It's sad when that happens. Listen, I don't want you, to, if, I'm, if I'm standing this way, I hope everybody knows I'm a man, right? I shouldn't be, it shouldn't be some like guessing game, like we're all taking lots, you know. <laughs> you know, is that a man or is that a woman, okay? There needs to be a stark difference but the lines are being blurred you have men wearing dresses now and like that's the, oh you're so brave no you're weak I mean it, it's, it's a crazy gender bending world that we live in and listen I'm still ready for I'm waiting for Rod Serling to jump out here right now smoking a cigarette and saying we've just entered the twilight zone <laughs> now the older people know what I'm talking about Okay? The old black and white, you know, it's just like, imagine if you will. <laughs> a world in which men are women and women are men. In a, in a world where a single person will be referred to as they, them, their. <laughs> now you've just entered the twilight zone. I mean, we are living in that world. It's crazy. And the thing is, we were just talking about this earlier today. You know what? That's crazy, and those people are nuts. Those people are psychopaths that, like, I'm just like, is your name Legion? Like, what's going on? But the thing is, is when people are actually buying into it, it's like they've jumped into the fantasy world. It's like Bruce Jenner, right? It, you know, says he's a woman now. And people are like, she's running for governor. She? What in the world are you talking about? Like, those are the people I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, I know he's a freak. Okay, I've already established that, right. but I'm like, why are you buying into this? It's just like you're, you're literally buying into this weird uh, twilight zone that we live in. Okay, and listen, you say, well, I, I'm going to lose friends. If I call this stuff out, if I call a spade a spade, I'm going to lose friends. Listen, you're going to gain more in the house of God than you'll ever lose out there. Okay, and so what? You know, it... it the Bible says, I have decided to follow Jesus. If, if none go with me, still I will follow. Yeah. I don't care. Listen, in this world, if everybody, if everybody in here is just like, you're out to lunch about this, I think that men can be women and women can be men. Bye. You know, I'm leaving, you know, you guys have fun. But listen, I'm not, I'm not going to buy into this weird, psychopathic, alternate reality that we live in this twilight zone that we live in today, and we need to put a difference between men and women. The Bible says that we need to give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Unto the weaker vessel. And you know what? Today, you know, first of all, people are like, you're saying that you're smarter than women. I never said that. You, you thought that. You know, that's not what I said. But people are just, they're just quick to be offended and think I'm just saying that, you know what, I'm so much smarter than my wife. You know, all this. No, I'm stronger than my wife. Listen, I'll challenge any lady in here for an arm wrestling match. <laughs> you could you can maybe even do two people at once if you want to. But listen, the strongest man will always be stronger than the strongest woman. Always. You'll find some outlier, some guy that, can, that is really weak and just needs to get into the gym. Okay? <laughs> but you know what? Men are stronger than women. It's just a fact. It's a biological fact. I remember trying to give the gospel to this one girl that I went to high school with, and she had this real feminist girl like with her, and we were just talking about, I don't even know how it got brought up, but the fact that men are stronger than women, and she got really offended by it. I'm just like, where are we living? And this was years ago. This is before the whole, you know, like she, them, they, zer, z, or whatever they are now. And I'm just like, when did we leave just logical facts as far as biology and anatomy and just the fact of just obvious facts, okay? And, but we need to make a difference. And I know it seems silly, okay? But when this conversation comes up, you know, you know when they say how many genders there are? There's only one answer. 
There's two. Okay? But you know what? You know how hard it is for people to say that today? You may think that's... You know, I, I wish we had a time machine where we go back in 2010 and when we, you know, we were fighting, you know, Pastor Anderson was fighting against a lot of these things and, and you know, just kind of leading the charge. And, and obviously pastors, other pastors too, you know, that have been preaching and, and going on, you know, before even the, the new IB, uh, you know, got jump started and all that stuff. This stuff has been preached. And if you went back just 10 years ago and told me that people would get upset if you said there was two genders, I mean, I would have thought you were nuts. I'm like, there's no way. There's no way that we're going to get to a day when people are just literally losing their minds when you say there's only two genders. But now we're in a time where you'll lose your job in some cases. You'll lose your job if you say there's two genders. But you know what? You need to speak up. Because if you don't speak up, listen, remember this, they're implacable. You lay down, they'll just keep coming for more. But you know what? These people are dogs, the Bible says. You know what? And a lot of times with dogs, all you have to do is get in that one little scare, and then they, they go away. But maybe sometimes you need a taser or something like that, you know? <laughs> but I did not say to go out and tase anybody, okay? <laughs> but, but the idea here is that you've got to stand up. And listen, people are there and will, will actually stand up if you do. Because there's times where I'd be in my office or, you know, just dealing with people, and, and, and they, they'd come up to me, and ask me something, something that's going on, and I'll be like, yeah, that's wicked, it's disgusting, and they're just like, yeah, I agree with you. But they don't want to say it too loud. And most people agree with us that on these issues that there's only two genders, and agree with us that all this stuff is crazy, and we're living in the twilight zone, but everybody's too afraid to stand up. We need more people to stand up. And listen, young generation, it's time. It's time for you to stand up. It's time, and listen, all of us need to do this. We all need to stand up. We need to do it, whether it's in our workplace, whether it's just out in public, and do it nicely. You don't have to go out and just start trying to grandstand everybody. But listen, if the subject bring, being, is brought up, you just need to say, hey, listen, there's a difference between men and women. There's a difference between the holy and the unholy. There's a huge difference between... You know, my family where I have a wife that, that I'm only to her and I have four kids and some sodomite that has some sodomite partner that wants to adopt kids and bless those kids. There's a huge difference between that. And we need to fight. We need to fight for that. Now, that being said, you know, the Bible says that we need to abhor that which is evil and love that which is good. And you say, well, what can I do? Well, listen, if you have compassion, you'll make a difference. You go out soul winning, you get people saved, you're going to make a difference. If you put a difference between uh, the holy and the unholy, you're going to make a difference. And also, if you are different, okay, you need to be different. The Bible says that we are a peculiar people, okay? He calls us a peculiar nation, but a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now, Peculiar, I don't believe that means strange, like weird and backward, okay? So don't, people are like, people will be like really backward and weird and be like, well, we're supposed to be a peculiar people. No, that's not what I believe that's talking about. But, you know, and there, there are people out there, I'm like, listen, you need to be peculiar, not weird, okay? Because you can be a normal person and, and not, you know, and be a Christian and go soul winning. But listen, you know what's peculiar? Coming out on a Friday night and hearing preaching. That's peculiar. You know what's peculiar? Reading the Bible and memorizing the Bible and spending large amounts of time studying. You know what's peculiar? Going out door to door and, and giving people the gospel, inviting them to church. That's peculiar. That's different. Okay? And listen, it doesn't take much today to be different. Okay? Ladies, you know what's going you know to make you peculiar in this world? Put on a dress, go to church, and say there's only two genders. Men, you know, what's going to make a difference in this world is if you just put on a pair of pants, you know, go to church and say there's only two genders. Amen. Now, this isn't a sermon just to say there's only two genders. But listen, that's how crazy it's gone. And listen, the darker it gets, the brighter the light will shine. Amen. Okay? Our world is getting really dark. Yeah. But you know what? 
that light is just, sh just shining even brighter. Okay? It's just like if you had a flashlight. If I had a flashlight on right now, you probably wouldn't see it that well. It probably wouldn't hurt your eyes. But if I turned off all the lights and then I stuck it in your eyes, you'd be like, I can't see anything. You're going to be seeing like circles and stars after that because of that. And so you need to be different. You need to put a difference between the unclean and, and, and the clean. You need to be different. Be not un unequally yoked with unbelievers. And it says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and yeah. touch not the unclean thing. Right. You need to be separate. Amen. Separate from the world, but in the world. Okay? We're not omnish. You know, we're not going to go on some convent somewhere and just basically live on our own. And listen, the world's pretty weird right now, and that convent's looking better. Okay? <laughs> but obviously, that's not what we're supposed to do. Okay? Wouldn't it be cool just to live out here and just like have fun and live off the land, right? But how are people going to get saved? That's right. That's right. How are you going to make a difference doing that? You know, I, I, I preached against the Amish. I, I love that you know, want to get the Amish saved, obviously. But you know what? They're not going to make a difference. Thank God they, got a different, they have a different gospel, so thank God they're not trying to do it. But if we just went on a convent somewhere, we're like, hey, listen, we all believe alike. Let's just go out somewhere and, and just live out there and just live in harmony. What about the rest of the world? What about the multitudes that Jesus said he had compassion on and says, I need more laborers and pray for more laborers? Now, the last point I want to make here is you say, well, what can we do? What difference can we make? Go to, go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. The Bible says, as you're turning to John chapter 6, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says in verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Or, I'm sorry, uh, as much as you know that <clears throat> your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay? When you're working for the Lord, and you're not working, you know, you're just living for the world, and living for the sustenance of this world. Listen, when you work for eternal value, then it's not going to be in vain. Listen, if you just live for the world and live to just work and get food and get a house and get food and live in the house and get food and pay for the house and get food and just have clothes and all these things, listen, that's all vanity and vexation of spirit. That's right. Okay? Yep. That you're not going to make a difference just living like that. Right. No, the way you're going to make a difference is laboring for the Lord. Amen. And <clears throat> in John chapter 6 here, a very famous passage about feeding the 5,000. Verse 5 here says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great multitude come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, <clears throat> that every one of them may take, take a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, <clears throat> There's a lad here, <clears throat> which hath, hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are these? I'm sorry, what are they among so many? And you may ask yourself, what are we among so many? And, and listen, what did Jesus do with that? With those five loaves and those, those few little fishes, right? Or those two fishes. He fed them all and he had leftovers. Listen, there's a quote, and I don't like to make quotes. I'm not one that, that has like a poem, a quote, and a prayer, and <clears throat> have some cute sermon. But there's a, there's a quote from Samuel Adams that kind of always uh, hit me as far as dealing with going against the odds, if you will, or basically being the minority. And this, this one, is, it says, It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather I, I rate and tireless minority to set brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. And you know what? When you think about, you know, independent Baptists or even, um, even the, the friends that we have in independent Baptist churches, you, you can say, well, what are we among so many? What are we? You know, who are we? What kind of difference can I make? And I think about, you know, sometimes that hits me. I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, how are we going to affect? How are we going to make a difference? And even in West Virginia, which isn't a huge state, but, you know, when I'm pastoring a church and I have about 75 people there, which, you know, I praise God, I love my church. I wouldn't trade them for the world. But you think, what are we going to do? What, how are we going to make a difference? But you know what? 
<clears throat> they said the same thing. Andrew said the same thing about those, those, those five barley loaves and those two fishes. And he says, what are they among so many? How in the world is this going to feed everybody? And you could ask that same question. What am I going to do individually that's going to change everything? Or change anything? But listen, I, I, it doesn't take a majority to win. And actually, you know what? God actually doesn't like dealing with the majority. A lot of times in the Bible, he likes to use a small group of people. Okay? And if you think of Gideon, and I was going to go to that, but just for sake of time, Gideon, there was 32,000 troops that Gideon had. Okay? We don't really figure that out until after God takes them all away from him. Okay? But he's going against the Midianites, who's like basically the sand of the sea, right? You're dealing with a huge host, okay, of an army. And God's like, <clears throat> not going to do it. Too many. You have too many. And you're like, what do you mean you had too many? We already have few as it is comparative, comparatively. And he dwindles it down to 300. 300 against an army that you couldn't even number. And God says, I don't want to do it with the 32,000 because you might actually think you did it with, by yourself. Right. Listen, when there's few, that means God's going to work. Amen. Okay? Yep. And you know what? You think of social media and, you know, the YouTube tries to take us down, Facebook tries to take us down. But listen, you take down avenues in which we are reaching people, just wait for God to work. Amen. Just wait to see what God will do if they try to silence us on social media right. and try to cut us off from that because... God's word will go forth. God's word is not bound. And you know what? We need a tireless minority of fundamental Baptists that will get fi on fire for God. And every time you win someone out to Christ, or out, out, out uh, door knocking and win them to Christ, you're setting a brush fire of freedom in their mind. Because you have made them free. Right? You know, it says, uh, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Amen. And he's made us free and you're, set, you're setting them on fire when you do that. When you get into church, you should be set on fire. Get it in your mind that, listen, just you as an individual, and it's going to take the individuals. Each one of you have to make the choice to say, you know what? I'm going to make a difference. Amen. You know, I decided to follow Jesus, and listen, if no one follows, still I will follow. When I was, before I started my church, there was a lot of churches that I went to. And there was a lot of churches that didn't like me. Okay? Not the church I got sent out from, they liked me. Okay? <laughs> they liked me, but there's a lot of churches that didn't like me. I was a troublemaker. Because I actually, you know, liked reading the Bible, liked talking about doctrine, and they didn't like that, okay? And there's a lot of times you can get disheartened, and a lot of you have been there where you've been to Baptist churches. You've been to churches, and they've shut you down. They put a wet blanket on soul winning, and they tried to get you to basically just fall in line with what they're doing and be dead as a doornail as they are, even though you wanted to do great things for God. You know what? I could have said, I could have said, well, what am I among so many? Who am I? that I should even care anymore. Why should I even care? They're trying to push me down. Why would I go to church? But I wasn't doing it for them anyway. Amen. I didn't go soul winning for some pastor. I didn't go soul winning for some church. I went soul winning for God. Amen. And you got to make it, you got to put it in your hearts. Listen, listen, young, young people. And I love what, talking to the young people because that is the next generation. Yeah. You have to put it in your minds that you're going to follow God. Not because your parents said it. Not because they, they brought you to church and you're forced to go to church. You have to put it in your own mind that I'm going to follow Christ. You're going to hold wor forth the word of, word of, uh, word of life. And, and that, you may, uh, you know, that your labor would not be in vain, the Bible says. You have to make that choice. Because in the end, I'm not doing it. To impress anybody okay and neither should you and the people that are the people that are doing it so that when they get to church they can say well here's how many I got saved and get the accolades and get you know uh, the pats on the back those people aren't gonna last because when persecution arise rises by and by they are offended you know what when they come after our churches 
You see who the strong Christians are. You see who has the roots. You see who's doing it for God and not just doing it for a show. And I'm not saying they're unsaved, okay? Those that fell on stony ground, the seed that fell on stony ground, those people are saved, okay? But you'll find out who does it for God and who doesn't. But in the end, I'm not doing it just to be famous. I'm not doing it to be famous at all, okay? But if fame gets the word across more, then so be it. But in the end, I am doing it because I want God to be happy, I want Him to be glorified, and I want to, I want to make a difference. Amen. Okay? And in, in the Independent Fundamental Baptist movement, and in the new Independent Fundamental Baptist movement, I see a lot of disenfranchised Christians, right? I mean, when you think about people that come, a lot of people that come to my church or that have come to different churches, a lot of them are saying, we just can't find a church that wants us. You know? They don't want us around. We're just, we're too rough. <laughs> and listen, you know what? There's a lot of diamonds in the rough. But you have to make that choice. Okay? It's not just you found an independent Baptist church and you found a good church to go to. Listen, you have to make that choice to follow God. And notice what it says. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to end with this. Remember this. And if some have compassion making a difference, you need to have compassion. You need to love those that you talk to. Okay? When you out soul winning, look at them as if they're your family member. Or your best friend. Someone that you've just been wanting to get saved. Care about that person. Put a difference between the unholy and the holy. Between the bitter and the sweet. Between darkness and light. Put a difference. Look in the Bible. The Bible puts a stark difference. It says to hate the evil and love the good. That's as stark difference as you get. And you need to be different. You need to be different. If you want to make a difference, you need to be different. How are you going to make a difference if you're just the same as everybody else? You're just going to fall in line with everybody else. That's not going to make it. You've got to go against the grain. Listen, today, you know that rebellious teenager... Today, that's the fundamental Baptist. It really is. It really is. It's, it's someone that will say, you know what, I'm going to follow God. And everybody's just like, man, what is that person doing? What are they doing with their life over there? They look down on you. You're like, man, you're just wasting your life. What are you doing going to church? What are you doing going to some, going to some preaching night on a Friday when you could be having fun doing other things? But you know what? Being different will make a difference. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, it says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Amen. Remember, you say, who are we? What are we? I'm just one person. I'm just... I'm just Two people. I'm just one family. What am I going to do? How am I going to make a difference? Your zeal can provoke very many. And you know what? There's pastors that, I, that I've looked up to that have provoked me. Do you know that I wouldn't have started a church if I didn't have pastors like Pastor Anderson, Pastor Burgess, Pastor Jimenez, that I was looking up to to say, hey, I want to do that too. Their zeal provoked very many. And you know what? When I, when I look at my church and I see the people that are growing and I see souls that are being saved and hundreds of people getting saved every single year through our church, listen, that's making a difference. Yes. You say, well, what can I do? Maybe you could do the same thing. Maybe you could do more. But you have to make that choice in your mind. Choose you this day. And don't let it just be some emotional. Listen, there's all, it's, it's fine to be emotional. It's fine to like, just be like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to do that and have that motion. But you need to say, hey, you know what? I need to do that. I need to make sure that I'm going to read my Bible every day and I'm just going to stick with it and make a difference. Because there's a lot of people, there's, there's a lot of friends. Listen, in the, in the last 10 years, I've lost a lot of friends that just fell out, that don't do it anymore. It's easy to get disheartened. But then I think about what if my other friends fell out? Right? 
What if other pastor friends that I had fell out? You know, how many people wouldn't have gotten saved? How many lives wouldn't have, would have, been, wouldn't have been changed? And so we need to make a difference. And that's pretty much what I wanted to get across is to, you, to make a difference, you need to have compassion. You need to put a difference between, you know, sin and righteousness. And we need to be different. Be different to make a difference. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And thank you for everybody that came out today. And just pray that you'd be with us as we, uh, as we uh, sing some more songs, but also as we hear uh, preaching from Pastor Anderson. And Lord, just pray that you'd uh, help us to make a difference in this world and to live for you. And Lord, we love you and pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.